from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to the fourth chapter of John's Gospel, a wonderful story in the life of Jesus Christ. And just one verse of Scripture, and it's a very brief verse, it says, and he must needs go through Samaria. Jesus had been teaching. The scribes and the Pharisees had been listening. They had told him that John the Baptist had just been imprisoned. And he taught as one having authority. And the people came to listen. And he taught in great simplicity so that the common people heard him gladly. And now he has to go back to Galilee. He's down south in Judea. Now he's going to go to Galilee. He doesn't get on a plane. He doesn't get on a bus. He doesn't get in a car. He walks. And while it wasn't a very long distance by today's standards, in those days, that was a long distance to go from Judea up to Galilee. And he was going to Cana. But it says he must needs go through Samaria because, you see, the Samaritans and the Jews didn't get along. They didn't like each other. They avoided each other. The Samaritans had intermarried. They were not pure-blooded. And then they had the Jewish people would always go on the eastern side or they'd go the western side of the Jordan River to avoid going through Samaria. But Jesus, it says, must needs go through Samaria. Why? because Jesus had an appointment there that he was going to keep. That appointment had been made centuries earlier in the council halls of God that he must needs go through Samaria. You know, much of the Bible lands is desert. Water is extremely important. Wells are important. And in Samaria, at the foot of two mountains, was Jacob's well that Jacob had dug. There's not only water that you drink for your physical needs, but there's spiritual water. Jesus said, I am the water of life. Jeremiah said, for my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me the fountain of living waters and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. In a number of places, the Bible refers to people who have no spiritual water. Ye shall be as the garden that hath no water, says Isaiah, the first chapter. In Zechariah, it says, prisoners of the pit wherein there's no water. 2 Peter 2, 17, these are wells with no water, spiritual water. The Scripture says in Isaiah, but the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There's no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. It says that the waters are like our own hearts. Our hearts are troubled and they never rest. I watch the waters, they never seem to rest. They're always moving and disturbed. And God says there's no peace to those who reject God. There's no peace to those who are not living for God. Now the scarcity of spiritual water throughout the world today is tremendous. People are hungry and thirsty. We read about it in our papers constantly. And people in this country are going to the wrong watering holes, searching for satisfaction, searching for something that only the water of life and the bread of life could meet. And that person is Jesus Christ, who is the water of life and the bread of life. You can go down our streets in the major cities of America and see our young people searching for something. They don't know what. Like that girl at Harvard University. She cried for several days, and finally the psychiatrist said, I can do nothing with her. And so they called for the family to come, and the father and mother came. And she finally blurted out to her father, Father, I want something, but I don't know what it is. And many people are like that. They're searching for something, and they go to all kinds of things 
whether it's drink or sex or whatever it is, to try to find that answer. Maybe it's money or maybe it's power, whatever it is. But it doesn't really satisfy the deepest longings of our hearts. Searching for something that will bring satisfaction and quench this terrible spiritual thirst that only God can satisfy. Water in the Middle East is very scarce and often hard to obtain. A man who owns a well of water is sometimes better off than if he owned a well of oil. Many wars have been fought over water. In our text today, Jesus has been teaching in Judea. He's going through Samaria. It's the shortest way, but it's not the way that the Jewish people of that day went because they had no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus knew about the woman that he was going to see. He knew that he had an appointment with that woman. He wanted to teach his disciples a lesson in race relations or a lesson in how to win people to Christ. Jesus was weary. He sits down at Jacob's well. The disciples had gone to town to buy food. This woman came. It was almost noon. Women usually came in the evening when it was cooler. But this woman came alone in the middle of the day when it was very hot. But because of her character, she was probably a social outcast. She came with her water pot to get water. And Jesus asked her for a drink. That absolutely shook her because Samaritans and Jews didn't even talk to each other. And certainly no Jewish person would ask a Samaritan for a favor. In just that moment, Jesus was sweeping away many prejudices that people have, like race prejudice. One of the greatest needs we have in America is for the Lord to come into our hearts and take away our prejudice against other people who don't look like we do and who don't have the same color of skin that we have. It takes full-time prayer and saying, oh God, take this from my heart. And then there was national prejudice because of the Jews and the Samaritans had nothing to do with each other. We have today a crisis in nationalism in many parts of the world. It's rising. That's the reason many people are concerned about the situation in the world, because there are many dangerous areas in the world. And I was always thankful for the work that people like James Becker did to help bring peace to the world. But Jesus saw this woman sitting there on Jacob's well, and he said, would you give me a drink? And she was astonished at such tolerance and courtesy and kindness that she saw in his eyes. And she said, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, which I'm a woman of Samaria, for the Jews have no dealings with us Samaritans? He didn't want to force religion on her. He begins on another subject entirely. He's tactful. He's diplomatic. He asks for a favor. He puts himself under obligation to the woman. Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that saith to you, give me to drink, you would have asked of him and he would have given the living water. God offers all of us a gift tonight. It's something you can't work for. It's something you can't buy. It's something you can't earn. It's a gift. It's free. It's spiritual water. It's forgiveness of all your sins because of the cross and the resurrection. Isaiah the prophet said in the 55th chapter, Ho, everyone that thirsted, come ye to the waters, and you that have no money, come and buy and eat. 
Yea, come and buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread? The prophet asked. And you labor for that which satisfies not. The thing that you work so hard for and the thing that you desire so much and the thing that you go out to enjoy doesn't satisfy. This woman replied, she said, Sir, you don't have anything to draw with and the well is deep. Where are you going to get that living water you're talking about? You see, she mistook the kind of water he was talking about. He was talking about living, eternal water. She went back to the well. She was talking about that water. Now, the Bible teaches that we are blind to the glories and the thrill of the love of God and the gospel. In 2 Corinthians 3.14, it says, but their minds were blinded. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, it says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. There's a supernatural power that blinds you, spiritually blind. Physically, you have perfect eyesight, but spiritually, you're blind. You were blinded by an outside spiritual force called the devil. 1 Corinthians 2 says, But the natural man, that's you, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Jesus said, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never thirst but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. He offers you that water tonight. Is your soul, is your spirit, is your mind thirsty for something more in life that you haven't found? Oh yes, you may be baptized. You might have been confirmed in the church and you're a good person and you go to church. But deep inside your heart, something is lacking. There isn't the fulfillment and the satisfaction and the peace that you would like to have and that you believe God could give you. What should you do? Drink of the living water. Jesus provides the living water at the cross. He went to the cross. As Mrs. Baker so beautifully told us a moment ago, and there he was beaten and reviled. That wasn't his real suffering. His real suffering came when he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In that terrible, awful, mysterious moment, God had laid on him the sins of the world. Your sins and my sins, everything I've ever done wrong was put on Jesus. He took the judgment and the hell that I deserve on that cross. Jesus was offering this woman water for her thirsty soul. Our souls are empty and lonely and guilty. She felt the emptiness of her own soul and she said, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not. She was very sincere, but sincerity alone is not enough. A few years ago in the Rose Bowl, a man picked up the football Everybody shouted. They were all to their feet because the score was tied, and he ran for a touchdown. But he'd gone the wrong way, and he scored for the other side. He was very sincere. You never saw a more sincere man as you watched him, but he was wrong. You can be sincere in your religion, but you can be wrong. There is a way, the Bible says, that seems right, but the end thereof is the way of judgment and death. You may be on the wrong road. God is asking you tonight to turn around toward the cross by faith. Repent of your sins and receive Him as your Lord and Master and make sure of it. 
There are hundreds of you here tonight that have religion, but you're not sure about your relationship with Christ. And you'd like to make sure before you leave here. You'd like to know that if you died tonight, you'd go to heaven. But you're not sure. You don't have that peace and that joy that you believe is there somewhere for you and you haven't found it. Come and take of this living water, which is Christ tonight. Now the kingdom of God is not entered easily. Jesus said you have to go through a narrow gate and walk a narrow road and you may be misunderstood and even persecuted and you may suffer for your faith. So Jesus said to her, go call your husband. Now he was hitting on a sore nerve. What a spot he touched in her life. He knew her sins. He knows yours. What an overwhelming flood of guilt and remorse this brought to her. She shrank back. It was as if a thousand searchlights had been turned on in her heart and every dirty secret in her life leaped into the glare. No person can come to Christ until there's conviction that you have sinned against God and you have repented. And repentance means to change your mind, change your direction, change your way of living. It means that you're willing to change. She partly covered it up and said, I have no husband. The scripture says, he that covered this sin shall not prosper. Jesus gently reminded her that technically she was right. She had no husband. She had had five husbands, and the man she was now living with was not her husband. And she said two things. Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. And please, sir, would you give me this living water? I want it. I need it. I need it in my life. At that moment, she acted on the light that she had, which wasn't much. You don't have to know much when you come to Christ. You don't have to know the whole gospel. You don't have to know the Bible. You just come like you are. The thief on the cross didn't know very much, but he turned to Jesus while he was dying and said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Just remember me. He had no time to join a church. He had no time to be baptized. He had no time for anything. He just said, Lord, remember me. And that's all that was needed because Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus said, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You and I are to worship God in spirit and in truth. Where you worship God is not the important thing. It's how you worship God. You worship him in prayer, in the reading of the Bible, in giving to the church, in going to church. We worship God and we adore him. And everything we do is an act of worship, if you know Christ. In all these ways, we worship God. Jesus made the greatest of all revelations to her when he said, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ, when he has come, he's going to explain all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he. I am the Messiah. What a shock that was to her, that she was talking to the Messiah that the Samaritans and the Jews both were looking for and we're looking for today. At that moment, she was converted. At that moment, her name was written in the book of life. At that moment, she guaranteed, she was guaranteed a place in the kingdom of heaven. And from that moment on, she became a witness. She proved that she, was, had, that she had met Christ. She left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, she didn't say it to the ladies because they probably had nothing to do with her. The men knew her. So she said it to the men. 
Come and see a man which told me all the things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ that we've been waiting for? And many Samaritans in that city believed. Here was the, a woman evangelist evangelizing among men, telling them about Jesus. She didn't have much theology to tell them. She didn't know what to say. All she said was, come and see Jesus, and Jesus will change your life as he's changed mine. Have you been to Jesus that way? Have you come? Are you sure your sins are forgiven? Have you been to the cross and said, Lord, I have sinned. I'm sorry for my sin. I'm willing to change my way of life. And I come by faith. I don't understand it all, but by faith I receive you as my Lord and my Master and my Savior. We've seen hundreds of people each of these two nights that we've been here come. And I ask people to come and stand in front of the platform. And as they come, you're coming and saying, Lord, I'm coming to you. I want to make sure of my relationship with you. I want this living water. I want this living water in my own life and in my home. I want this living water in my work. I want this living water at all times. I'm thirsty. I need God. I need to make sure. I need to make certain. We never know when our moment is going to come, when we have to face God. I'm going to ask you to get up and come tonight and make sure of your relationship with Christ. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait on you. And after you've all come, I'm going to have a prayer with you, say a word to you, and give you some literature that you can take back to your home and study and read, and it'll help you to grow. All over the stadium, from that top stadium up there, we've timed it. It takes about five or six minutes for you to come. Don't let distance keep you from Christ because you may never have a moment like this again. When will you ever have a moment in Pittsburgh like this again when you can come and make a commitment like this? Jesus said, if you are not willing to acknowledge me publicly before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father which is in heaven. There's something about coming forward publicly and settling it and sealing it in your life. We're going to, uh, Jesus died on the cross publicly for you. Now you can come publicly and say yes to him. You may be sitting down here. You may be up there. You may be up here in that middle section. Wherever you are, God is speaking to you. There's a little voice that says you ought to come to Christ. We're going to wait on you as you come right now to this living water. Just as hundreds of people have responded to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, so can you right where you are.
Just call the phone number on your screen right now. Special friends want to help you with this important decision, so don't wait. Please call now. You've come tonight, not to hear Billy Graham or to come to Billy Graham. You've come to Christ. And you that have been watching can come and drink of this living water and eat of this living bread that Jesus has promised. And it'll spring up into you a well of everlasting life and can change your life and change your home and change your relationship with your neighbors and your friends round about. Give your life to Christ tonight. Turn from your former way and say, Lord, I'm ready for a change, but you're going to have to help me because I'm too weak to change. I've tried and it doesn't work. Lord, you help me. He'll help you. He loves you with an everlasting love, deeper than any love you've never known on this earth. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or if you're in Canada, write to Billy Graham, 20 Hopewell Way Northeast, Calgary, Alberta. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to 1 Kings, the 18th chapter. 1 Kings, the 18th chapter in the Old Testament. 1 Kings 18. And this is one of the most dramatic stories in all the Bible. 1821. How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal be God, follow him. And the people answered, not a word. Elijah is the most remarkable character to me in all the Old Testament. I like to read about him. He's mentioned 30 times in the New Testament. And when Jesus Christ went to the Mount of Transfiguration, there were two men that were there with him. Elijah and Moses. So we know that hundreds of years after Elijah had died or had been taken to heaven, we know that he came back. And we know that he was living and he was talking because he was on the Mount of Transfiguration. But here in his life story, he suddenly appears at the darkest moment of Israel's history. Never had the nation gone so low morally spiritually, militarily, economically, as it was at this hour. The nation was struggling for its very existence, and out of nowhere there came this rugged, strong, craggy, young, long-haired, sun-tanned son of the desert, Elijah. And he suddenly announced to the people, Elijah is here. And the king trembled on his throne because Elijah came in the power and the anointing of the Spirit of God. It used to be said that Mary, Queen of Scots, was more afraid of the prayers of John Knox, one preacher, than she was all the armies of England. One man 
and God constitute a majority anywhere. Elijah was a mighty prophet of the Lord. And what had happened in Israel that had caused Israel to go down so rapidly was that a very wicked man had come to the throne. His name was Ahab. And the Bible says that he did more evil than any other king that had ever preceded him. And then he did something else. He married a woman from one of the heathen nations, which was against ancient Israeli law. He married Jezebel, and she worshipped Baal. She didn't believe in God. She didn't believe in the God of ancient Israel. She didn't believe in the God of Moses. She didn't believe in the God of Abraham. She believed in Baal. And Baal was one of the worst forms of worship that we've ever known. Filled with sensuality, sex orgies, human sacrifice, and all the rest. And this is a very interesting thing, that in a time when people turn away from the true God, many times you'll find that they will put sex, violence, and their religion together. And we're seeing indications of that in America with the rise of Satan worship and their cults, the emphasis on sex, the emphasis on violence. Put them together and you have something the Bible says that God abhors and God will judge and the wrath of God will fall upon that people. And that was the situation when Elijah appeared on the scene. And the first thing Elijah did was to protest. Except Elijah was almost alone. He thought he was alone. But God had told him later that there were 7,000 that hadn't bowed the knee to Baal. And Elijah said to the king, all right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to gather all the prophets of Baal that believe in idolatry and lead idolatry in this country. I want you to gather them at Mount Carmel that looks out over the Mediterranean Sea. And I'll come up there and we'll let all the people come and watch and we'll have a contest. I will debate the 450 prophets of Baal publicly and let the people decide who is God. And the king said, all right. So all the people gathered, thousands of people gathered on Mount Carmel and the 400 prophets of Baal. And Elijah was standing for God alone. He was just one man, one solitary prophet standing there all by himself. He said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get two bulls, build two altars. You call on your God, Baal. I'll call on my God, the true and the living God, and we'll see who answers by fire. They said, all right. So they built their altar. They cut their bull, bullock up, laid it on the altar, thousands of people watching, and then they began to call on Baal. They said, oh, Baal, 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 answer by fire. We know you're the true God. Nothing happened. And Elijah stood there and laughed at it. And it's one of the most humorous things in all the Bible. He said, go ahead, yell. Maybe your God's on a trip somewhere. <laughs> and from morning till noon, they screamed and they yelled and they cried and they prayed and then they began to cut themselves until blood was gushing out all over the place, trying to get Baal to answer. But of course, Baal couldn't answer. Then Elijah said, all right, it's time for me to take over. He said, all right, build the altar. And they built the altar, put the bullock on the altar. He said, now I want you to get 12 barrels of water and pour it on top. Dig a trench around it, fill that with water, and everything is soaking wet. Then Elijah called upon God. And the fire came down from heaven 
and burned up the bullock and burned up the altar, burned up the whole thing. And the people said, we believe in the Lord God who is answered by fire. And Elijah won the day and left Mount Carmel victorious over the false prophets of Baal. I want you to notice who was there. Three groups of people. One group, one man, Elijah. So on the other side, 450 prophets of Baal, all experts in religion, philosophy, and psychology. And, on the, and out in between were the vast mass of people who were not sure. They were uncommitted. They were not sure whether Baal was God. They were not sure whether Elijah's God was God. Their ancient, ancient traditions made them want to believe in Jehovah. Their interest, though, was in pleasing the king and being relevant and being in. They didn't want to be old-fashioned and traditionalist and out of step. They didn't want to be caught believing in the Ten Commandments if that wasn't the end thing. You see, men have always been sort of faddist. We go after fads. That's true in every generation. And the end thing at that moment was to believe in Baal with all the freedom of sex and sensuality and the orgies. Now, they didn't like the human sacrifice, but all religion demands some sort of sacrifice, so what they would do, they'd take their babies, many times a chosen baby, and put in the hands of this great God and the baby would be burned up and they'd give their babies as human sacrifices. That was Baal worship. But then there were many who were secret followers of the true God. They didn't believe all that hocus-pocus about Baal. They had a guilty feeling about it, but they were afraid. They were afraid of standing up for God, afraid of standing up for what they believed to be truth. And so they didn't take a stand publicly. You see, Jesus demands a public stand. That's why I ask people to come forward. He demands a public stand. You can't be a secret follower of Jesus and please him. He said, if you're not willing to take your stand publicly and openly, I'll not take my stand openly for you in heaven. And without the intercession of Jesus Christ, none of us would ever make it. And then Elijah said something to all these people. If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. He said, make a decision. God's not going to allow you to have an altar to Baal in your home, to materialism in your home, and then go to church on Sunday and think that's going to do it. You've got to come all out for Jesus Christ. He must be first and Lord in every area of your life if you're to be acceptable to God. Now, the people had seen the evidence. They knew Baal couldn't give them peace and joy and happiness. They knew that. You know, one of our most famous film stars said the other day this. I won't call her name, but she was quoted in one of the magazines as saying this. I was the victim of the American dream. I'd been brought up to believe that when I found success, I would automatically be terribly happy. We were all taught that. Well, I got the success. I'd spent 21 years believing that as soon as all these wonderful things happened to me, my troubles would vanish. Well, they didn't. It, it was a big disillusionment, she said. And she's only 21 now. 21 years. thinking that if she made it on television, and she's famous on television, and she's famous in motion pictures around the world, that she'd be happy. She said it's been a big disillusion. You see, Baal can't bring inner peace and satisfaction to the human heart. Pascal once said it, the great scientist. He said, happiness is neither within or without us. It is in God. And only when God is in us is happiness within us and without us. How true that is. Happiness and peace and joy come in knowing God. 
Baal couldn't answer their deepest needs, their great philosophical questions of where did I come from, why am I here, where am I going? Baal gave them no answers. Neither does capitalism and materialism and secularism and humanism. It's found only in a relationship with God. You see, you were made for God made in God's image, made for fellowship with God. And you can try all your life in a thousand different directions to find that certain something and you'll never find it. I've seen men strive to become the most brilliant scientists and I know some of the most brilliant scientists in America that are miserable. I've seen men spend their lifetime making money and I know some of the richest men in America and I know how miserable some of them are. I've seen men strive all their lives to attain political power. And they get political power. They get the office they were seeking, but it doesn't bring the peace and the joy and the happiness and the fulfillment they thought it would. But here's an interesting thing. I've never seen a person give their lives to Jesus Christ sincerely, but what they didn't find, what they were looking for. He satisfies the deepest longings of our hearts and our lives. Now, Elijah taught us one thing, and Jesus teaches it too. You must make a choice. You have a will of your own, and you have to decide. How long will you halt between two opinions? Jesus said there are two ways of life. Now, the Bible says there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Some of you think you're all right and that you're on the right road now. You don't realize that you're on the broad road that leads to destruction. Jesus said there are two roads, the broad road and the narrow road. The narrow road leads to eternal life. The broad road leads to destruction. And every person in this audience tonight is on one or the other. Which are you on? He said there are two masters. He said you cannot serve God and mammon. You'll either hate one and love the other or love one and hate the other. He said make a choice. He said there are two fathers. You know, the Bible doesn't teach the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, not in the sense that many people teach it. By creation, he's our father. By creation, we're all members of the same human race, and that's why we're to love each other no matter what race we come from. We're all brothers in that sense. But spiritually speaking, spiritually speaking, we are not all of the same father and all of the same blood. There are only two groups, those who are lost and those who are saved, those on the broad road, those on the narrow road. You must be on one or the other. And there are two destinies. There is a heaven and there is a hell. I know it's not popular today to believe in hell. You can believe in heaven, but people would rather not think about hell. I don't blame you. It's a terrible place. But the Bible teaches it's going to be a hell. There is a hell where men are going to be separated from God forever. And there's a heaven where men are going to fellowship with each other and fellowship with Christ forever. You must make a choice. You young people, you have to make the choice. This is one choice you can't depend on your parents to make for you. Your parents can teach you and help you and do their best. And many of you parents have done your best with your children. You've prayed for them. You've loved them. But there comes a time when they have to make their own choice about Jesus Christ. They have to decide for themselves in the lonely arena of their own hearts. The greatest battle that's ever fought is this battle in the heart of a young person about Jesus Christ. And this is one thing you can't depend on anybody to make for you. You have the ability to make it. You have the right to make it. You can say yes or you can say no. It's one or the other. And Jesus does not allow neutral ground. And he warns against waiting too long. The Bible says now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. He that hardeneth his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. Come while you can. 
Don't put it off any longer. How long halt you between two opinions? Now, when you make that choice, there's going to be a price to be paid. The people that choose Jesus Christ will pay a price. There are thousands of people in other parts of the world. The price they have to pay is they're ostracized from their family. In some parts of the world, they can never go any further than grammar school if they make a decision for Christ. They can never get a job above menial labor if they make a decision for Christ. But in those parts of the world, thousands upon thousands are living for Jesus Christ. In America, we've had sort of an unnatural situation. It's almost popular to follow Christ in some areas of the country now. That won't last long. There's always a price. And if you receive Christ as your Savior and try to live for him, some people are going to sneer and they're going to make fun behind your back. And in this period of conformity, we don't want to be considered too different. But he calls upon you to be different. When the gang is doing certain things you know to be wrong, you take your stand and say, no, I can't do that because I'm a Christian, because I believe in Jesus Christ. It costs something to follow Christ. And Jesus said, you better sit down and count the cost one day. You see, a big crowd was following Jesus, and he said, wait a minute, count the cost. Do you know that I'm going to die on a cross, and if you follow me, you're going to have to go die with me? Oh, we didn't know that, Jesus. We thought you were setting up a big kingdom. We were going to be in the kingdom with you. So they left him. They will, there will be the cross for you to bear before the crown. And when you do come to Jesus Christ, you're going to be tested by God. God never has anyone come to him that he doesn't test you. Some of you have made your decisions for Christ this week and already you're being tested. Temptation is coming. A friend doesn't understand the step that you've taken. Already you're filled with some doubts and weakness. This is all normal to every person that ever came to Christ. We don't start, just jump right out and be full grown. Grady Wilson, just, his daughter just had twins. Well, they weren't born full grown. One of them was five pounds and one was six pounds, and they're just little tiny babies. But they will be full grown someday. But it takes time to grow. God will test you when you come to Christ. And he demands an immediate decision. I wonder how many more sermons it would take to win you to Christ. How many more warnings will God have to give you? How, how many more graves will have to be dug? How many more wars will have to be fought? How many more earthquakes or tornadoes and floods will have to come before you make your decision? The thief on the cross took that one moment and said, Lord, remember me. And in that moment, Jesus said, Thou shalt be with me in paradise. That quick, you can make your decision and commitment. And remember, God loves you. He has a plan for your life. You're sinful. You're separated from God by sin. And some of the results of this sin are worry and irritability and lack of purpose in life, as well as some of the gross, immoral sins that we read about. God has provided the cross as a means for you to be forgiven of sin. But you must individually receive Christ as your Lord and your Savior. You and you alone in the quiet arena of your heart will have to make that decision. How long will you halt between two opinions? Charlotte Elliott was a beautiful woman. And a great preacher by the name of Caesar Milan went all over Switzerland. He was put out of his church because of his faith. But once he was in England and he met this beautiful, charming young woman by the name of Charlotte Elliot. She was suffering ill health. And he went up to her and asked her if she would become a Christian. And she rebuked him and said, I resent you asking me that. And she was very irritated at him. 
He said, I didn't mean to be offensive to you, but I only meant to tell you that God loves you and God's willing to change your life and give you peace in your heart. That night, Charlotte Elliott could not sleep. The words that the preacher spoke to her kept ringing in her ears. And during the night, she got up, got on her knees, gave her life to Christ, and she sat down and wrote the hymn that we sing every night. Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come, just as you are. You don't have to go home and change clothes. You don't have to go home and get better. You can't improve yourself. You come just like you are, with all your sins, with all your failures, with all your mistakes, with all your hypocrisy. You come just as you are. He will forgive you and change you and come into your life. And I'm going to ask you to do just that publicly and openly right now. I'm going to ask hundreds of you to get up out of your seat from all over this stadium and come and stand in front of this platform and say by coming, I do receive Christ. You may be a member of the church. You might have thought that you were right with God before, but somehow you know you're not. You're not sure. You're not certain, but you'd like to be. I'm going to ask you to come right now. From up in the top galleries, it'll take a minute or two to come, but we're going to wait. Hundreds of people have come every night. You come. This is your moment and your hour of commitment. And after you've all come and stand here quietly, I'm going to say a word to you, have a prayer with you, give you some literature, and you can go back and join your friends. And if you're with friends or relatives or you've come in a bus, they'll wait on you. But you get up and come right now and make your commitment to Christ. We're going to wait. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. that are watching by television, you can make your commitment right now in your home or wherever you happen to be watching. Hundreds of people here at the University of Kentucky Coliseum are coming to Jesus Christ. They're choosing between these two opinions. They're choosing Christ. They're coming just as they are. You can come just as you are where you are. May God help you to make that commitment tonight. God bless you. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina.